great to be here. Um, yeah, I, sh I should first of all acknowledge the George Institute in Sydney, who flew me out there last year and made me a distinguished fellow, which is great fun because all it means is that I, can, I go out there from time to time and I have fun activities with the, with the old friends in Sydney. Uh, so it's kind of a home from home coming here. Yeah, so, oops a daisy, I'm just playing with this technology until I get used to it. Um, the, the work I'm going to tell you about is partly empirical and partly theoretical, but the, the theoretical bit is what we've called the NAS framework. And NAS stands for five problems that happen really commonly with technology supported change in health and social care. So the five problems are two problems that happen with individuals, non-adoption, people just don't use technologies at all, or abandonment. They use them for a bit and then they stop using them. And then three things that happen at the organizational level, problems with scale up, um, problems with spread, which is um, scale up locally, spread meaning spreading somewhere else and sustainability it works okay for a few months and then it just fades out it's sort of equivalent to abandonment but at the organizational level so those five things we've called NAS and let me tell you where NAS came from NAS came from me going I can't remember which way around this goes yeah um, off to Bellagio on a Rockefeller uh, fellowship for a month I had to sit in a villa and look out over Lake Como and actually read stuff and look at data and think uh, and it was the most wonderful kind of um, headspace. Uh, and that's where NAS, that's where the NAS framework kind of got put together. Um, so we should thank the Italians and, and, and Rockefeller. Um, we, this is work based on my Wellcome Senior Investigator Award. And I'm not going to tell you in any detail uh, about this, but the Wellcome Trust funded me for five years to do a number of big longitudinal case studies of technology supported change. This was not studies of the adoption of technology by individuals. This was studies of an organization that wanted to change a service with the aid of a technology. So for example, Bart's Health wanted to introduce video consultations as part of the outpatient experience. If you don't want to come to hospital and the doctor says it's all right, you can instead connect up by Skype. Uh, M health for epilepsy, that's pretty obvious. So you've got a kiddie or an adult with epilepsy and you wear these little Fitbit type things. And they'll tell you whether they've had a fit in the night or you know, getting a bit of pity mal or something like that. The risk analytics, big sort of heavy IT, pulling stuff from various records um, in order to generate a risk score uh, so that you can identify people at high risk of hospital admission and then proactively perhaps give them some support. Pendant alarms, that's pretty obvious. A quarter of a million of them out there. They're, they're a technology that, that does work. I'm going to tell you why. Um, telehealth for heart failure, uh, that's partly Kazim's work actually in the Support HHF study, but also some community based uh, work. So lots of different technologies being used, some of them implantable, like in the diagram, some of them like a blood pressure machine, you know, sensors and things. Um, care organizing apps, which is an app that you can have. Uh, to organise who's going to visit granny. It's mainly for relatives of someone who's got a lot of um, multiple needs uh, and different people can uh, join the app and, and the idea is that you get the care sorted out. These are very interesting. We've just written a paper about these. And the GPS tagging for people with mild to moderate dementia where they can wear a, like a wristwatch type thing, go off walking and then when they can't find their way home and they don't come home when you're expected. Uh, expecting them, you, you can track them down and, and go and rescue them. So di very different technologies, some were healthcare, some were social care, some were private sector, um, some were secondary care, some were primary care, so we deliberately had a maximum variety sample. Now, um, oops, I'm going back, sorry about this when you're videoing it. I, I study technologies, but I'm not very good at using them. Um, now, this is the stuff from the George in Sydney. Who's heard of the torpedo study? Okay, yeah, right. So you probably know more about it than I do. Um, th this is a risk assessment tool that was developed probably in the early 2000s. It began. The, the, the first publications came out in about 2008. So this is what it looks like. It comes up on the desktop of the GP and 
it, here we go, risk factors go in and then you get this sort of lovely colour thing. Um, this patient is in the yellow and that's not too good, you want to be in the green, you know, this kind of thing. And then also a kind of graph of, look, you're 45 now and this is what's going to happen with or without sorting your life out type thing. So that's the technology that I'm going to talk a bit about in addition to um, the work that I personally have done. Um, these are, are some of the studies that have been published from Torpedo. I was nothing to do with uh, this. So these people who many of you will know uh, are all from the George Institute in Sydney and or some of them moved on now, but um, Shay, who's been based here actually quite recently, he, he and I are doing what I'm calling a post hoc theorization because when I went to Sydney, a lot of dollars went into this, millions, uh, and it didn't quite get going the way they'd hoped. And we decided to apply the NAS framework retrospectively to an enormous data set um, to see if we could get more out of that experience. And, and, and I said, well, yes, we, we don't just want all the raw data that you've got from these papers. We also want some narratives from the people in the study, actually, the principal investigator, the people who were on the ground trying to make this uh, technology work. So Shay has been doing those uh, interviews and actually today is the first time I'm going to be presenting some of that data. It's still pretty raw. We haven't really analysed it properly, but I think it's a great example of a, a really promising technology where they did a lot of things right, but it still didn't work. So. Um, <laughs> Just for those of you who are not familiar with Torpedo, huge program. The idea was they'll get hold of the existing evidence-based guidelines, not just for cardiovascular disease, but for things like kidney disease, you know, the relevant ones around uh, that kind of cardiovascular kidney diabetes cluster. Um, and they produce the technology, it's very rigorously developed, co-designed, tested in a cluster RCT that I couldn't fault, but then I'm not a trialist. In the real world, the uptake was patchy, some clinicians didn't use it at all. Um, process measure, there was modest change. And you know the thing, if the, if, if the condition is pretty prevalent, even a modest change uh, in process can lead to uh, important changes in outcomes. Um, there wasn't a great deal in the literature about documented change in outcomes, but then it might take a long time to have the heart attack that you might not have had, if you know what I mean. Um, it was assessed as cost effective. I'm not going to talk about that, but, but you know, it, wasn't, it didn't cost a huge amount given um, the impact that it had. Uh, and this, I think, is quite important. They did have quite a lot of data that showed it worked better in the white middle class patients and less well in the minority ethnic groups with low education, low health literacy. Okay, so that is um, the torpedo study, and I'm going to be kind of populating my talk with, with some examples from that. This is an NAS framework, and I'm going to go through it uh, domain by domain. So in this diagram, it's got seven domains. I've actually added another domain since this got, got published, and I'll tell you why later. And I'm going to go through it one by one. But first of all, this talk is really about complexity. And everything in life is either simple, complicated, or complex. So simple, making a sandwich, open the fridge, get the bread out, you know, that kind of thing. Very straightforward, very predictable, few components. Building a rocket, you just get the stuff, follow the manual, you get the rocket. Every time you do that, you get the same rocket. Raising the child, have you done that? Because it doesn't matter what the manual says, it's not going to come out the same every time. Child two comes out differently from child one, even if you follow the manual religiously. The point about com complex phenomena is they're dynamic. They involve people, they involve interpersonal politics apart from anything else. Um, things are interdependent, things are always changing. You've got an open system. You can't apply predictive logic. Now, complicated follows the same logic as simple. Complex follows a completely different logic, you know, and that's the thing to get your head around. So what the NAS framework is all about is categorising things into whether they're simple, complicated or complex. Now, oops, you've seen that before. 
because I'm going the wrong way. Here we are. Okay, so the first domain that we have to think of, is it simple, is it complicated, is it complex, uh, is the condition or illness. Sometimes it's not, it's not a particular illness, sometimes it's a condition, for example, cardiovascular risk. Um, I've given you the broken ankle as an example of something simple, and I've given you cancer as something that's complicated. Once you know what cancer you've got, what stage, what grade it is, you know what the treatment's going to be, and you've got a pretty good idea of your, of, of your chances of survival. Aboriginal health, now, now this uh, health tracker was developed partly to address the, the really dreadful prognosis of, of cardiovascular disease in the Aboriginal population. Um, there are many different complexities, and I think I've got some um, quotes. So here's some quotes from the recent interviews with the torpedo team. Um, you know, the first, first thing is, what do you mean by high cardiovascular risk? You know, it sounds like it's like we've really reified that concept, and yet it, it plays out differently. Um, one of the issues with this is that you're identifying people who walk into your surgery feeling completely fine, and then you've shown them, look here, you've got to do this, you've got to sort yourself out. That actually makes it much more complex. Uh, funnily enough, it's simpler when someone's been in hospital with an episode of chest pain because you then got something to build on. Um, and a, a really nice quote here from one of the senior investigators about the sensitivities and challenges uh, of doing anything proactively preventive with, with, with a... With a, a a group that has many issues going on in their lives, shall we say. Um, and I, I'll come back with some more data on that. Um, the second domain in the NAS framework is the technology. Now, the material features of the technology are so often not put into the academic paper. What does it feel like? What does it look like? How clunky is it? How reliable is it? How dependable is it? Where does it come from? How much does it cost? What does it need to connect to? Um, I had a great quote from a study which I saw this morning. It's from a different study. And they're talking about taking this beautiful new piece of technology and connecting it up to the NHS infrastructure. And someone's talking about spaghetti versus linguine versus pappardelle and how thick the cables are, and all that stuff around bandwidth. And when you plug in this beautiful new piece of technology, the whole system crashes. So it's not necessarily the technology itself, it's the infrastructure that it needs to connect to. Um, the, what kind of knowledge does the technology bring into play? Um, for those of you who are familiar with actor network theory, that's a very actor network theory type question. Um, look, this stuff, is it meaningful? Is it trusted? Is it, you know, the stuff we're doing with, with Kazim, uh, with, you know, some people look at a list of figures and that's great. Other people say, I've got to have the patient in front of me. I can't do this remote stuff. It doesn't mean anything to me. I don't trust that data. Um, slight supply model, all that kind of thing. Now, I've put this complex. Ideally, they want it to open up from the electronic patient record, but actually this didn't. So that meant the technology was much simpler. It just sat on the desktop. On the other hand, it also meant that it wasn't tethered into, it didn't kind of feed automatically back into the patient record. They had to copy it out, as I understand it. I haven't actually played with this technology, uh, so I may be wrong there. Let me give you some quotes. So the first quote here is from the person who was the main project manager, who's actually just finished a PhD on this. Uh, as far as she was concerned, Everyone loved the technology, the GPs loved it and the patients loved it. Now she's right, I mean she knows a lot more than I do about it. What she meant was when it worked. When it worked, it looked beautiful and you've seen it. Yeah, look at that, isn't that good? And you can kind of say this is what happens when you stop smoking. So it's kind of interactive. Um, but also some of the other uh, senior researchers were saying, yeah, but actually it's enough, it makes the whole system crash. Next thing, you know, like, and you're there, you are. We've got 30 patients to see in the morning, and you click on this tool, everything grinds to a halt. That's no fun. Uh, so, this was really problematic. Um, just stop doing this. Is abandonment that, you know, the reinforcement of, well, you know, try it and try it and try it. You very soon backpedal, and then they won't go near it for years. Not for years. And they won't go near anything like it. 
Right, the third domain is the value proposition. If you've got a product, this is a kind of business stuff, everybody involved in that product, stakeholders they're called, has got to get value from it. Now that's either financial value or non-financial value. A really good example we've got in Oxford of a simple value proposition of what is sometimes called the non-invasive liver biopsy, a fancy scan. That's a slice through someone. This apparently, I'm told, is the liver. Um, and it means you, they don't have to go into hospital and have a needle put in and blood cross-matched and an overnight stay. So if you're the patient, there's an obvious advantage. If you're the hospital, there's an obvious financial advantage. Um, and actually, if you're the guy who developed this, you get pretty rich too. So everyone's pretty happy. You know, this is it's cheaper, it's, it's you know, safer, all that kind of thing. An example of a complex value proposition is this robotic wheelchair that never got going because there weren't very many people who wanted a robotic wheelchair. You know, most wheelchair users just want an ordinary one. They can fold up, stick in the back of the car. You know, this is big, it's heavy, it's, it's not answering back. Most wheelchair users don't want it. Um, so what's the value proposition of uh, torpedo, uh, of health tracker, I mean? Well, it depends who you ask. So, for example, when they were trying to sell the idea of this to the Aboriginal community, to, and, and the Aboriginal groups have these, this kind of community board, and you go along in there and talk to the elders, um, actually they thought this was great because almost everybody had got a relative who'd, who'd had you know, premature morbidity from, from one of these conditions. It, it's everywhere. So that was a positive. Um, the GPs who were into doing proactive care were quite keen because it just pulled out all the risk factors. So they liked it because it saved them time. Of course, if you weren't going to be doing that, if you were more reactive, then it was, it was, it was a bit of a waste of time. Um, Here's an interesting one. The Australian healthcare system is very different from ours. You know, with ours, you register with a GP and usually stay with that GP for the, you know, until you move away. Um, but with the Australian system, they don't have the registration and recall and all that kind of thing. So you sort of pop up. And then if you don't like that GP, then you, next time you go to the one down the road. So the GPs are, are talking about selling themselves as good evidence-based modern doctors. And so, of course, if you can pull up these kind of fancy tricks, the patient might be very keen and they might come to you because you've got the technology. But look at this. This is the, in, in multi-ethnic deprived parts of Sydney, actually the thing that is driving the patient to go to the GP is do they speak the same language as me? And they're not particularly interested in those um, computer gadgets. So this all feeds into a rather complex value proposition for whether the technology is bringing value or detracting value. Um, the adopter system, that just means people. So um, remember the first two things in NAS are non-adoption abandonment by individuals. So this is about what do the staff have to do, what do the patients have to do, what, it, what does everyone else have to do? Pendant alarm press the red button. Oh, that's pretty simple. I mean, except if you're having a fit or something, which doesn't work terribly well. It doesn't work terribly well if you're not wearing it, but never mind. This is more complicated. GPS tracking. The social workers kicked against this because they said, professionally, I can't possibly go around tagging people um, because it felt like state surveillance. It felt, you know, these things were designed for a parole use. Don't go within 200 metres of your ex-wife's house. It felt that they were putting a kind of geofence around and the alarm going off. Uh, and so they, they refused to use it. And actually, in 18 months, we only got 11 people using this, um, partly because of social worker resistance. So what happens with the individual adopters? Um, some GPs were, quote, resistant. And I've written quite a lot on clinician resistance. They've usually got a good reason for not doing something. It's usually not just sort of stubbornness and laziness. Uh, but that was, a, that was a big problem in some of the, uh, in some of the practices. Here's a possible reason why. Um, the amount of time to not prescribe in a consultation is much greater than the amount of time to prescribe. So actually using this tool effectively meant you had to have conversations which lengthened the consultation, etc., etc. And if you were trying to get as many people through as possible, in, in, you know, 
that may have been something. Um, this last quote is a quote from a patient, and I absolutely love it. So this was from the original torpedo data set. Um, I just look at that and think, that was my dad, you know. <laughs> so this is someone who's just come out of a consultation. GP has told him, you've got a heart age of 75 using health tracker, and this is what we've got to do, you sort yourself out, da 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 um, uh, I don't overdrink, I don't overeat, I'm just a big bloke. So there's an awful lot around patients' perceptions. And, and frankly, if the patient isn't going to take the tablets, isn't going to you know, change the lifestyle, we might as well all go home. Um, okay. The organisation. Now, this is a really big domain. Um, and the first question we ask about the organisation is, what is its general capacity to innovate? I'm going to give you some example quotes uh, in the next slide. And then how ready is the organisation for a particular technology supported change? So Bart's Health, pretty good, you know, pretty innovative organisation. Were they ready for video consultations? That kind of thing. Um, how easy will the funding decision be? How many different boards have, to, have got to sign it off? How much argy-bargying between the different groups? Um, the implications for team interactions and routines, any of you know normalisation process theory, know that the technology usually expects you to do things in a different way, pass things on to the, a different person in, in, in the team. Uh, and finally this, what is the work needed to actually implement the technology and get, uh, achieve the change? And actually this is the one that I'm going to put into a, a new domain all of its own because it's rather grown, uh, so we'll be doing that. So you can see the simple situation versus the more complex situation. I don't want to name names, which is why I haven't given you an example, but I could certainly give you examples anonymised of, of you know, health and social care organisations that I would just warn you off. Um, so here's some quotes from Torpedo. Um, some larger GP practices had been engaged in quality improvement work very strategically for 15 years. They already had an operational structure they could weave this particular innovation into. It's a very classic quote about an innovative organisation. You walk in there, for example, they know what to do when something comes on the horizon. They put it on the agenda for the practice meeting. They've already got pretty good um, hardware and software. Um, but the larger practices are going to be owned by someone. They're basically private organisations, and the, the chief or the, you know the chief executive, I don't know, the, whoever it is, who may make a decision that says, right, everyone's got to use this technology. Which actually, given that this is about using something in the clinical consultation, that command might go down. But it doesn't mean that I, as a doctor, am actually going to do that. Um, so here, one of the problems they had in Torpedo was that you'd get one or two GPs that were very keen, but the unit of analysis was the practice as a whole, which is why, even though the larger practices were often better equipped, often more in innovative, uh, the actual um, results from those larger practices were often not any better than from the smaller practices. Now, the smaller practices, ha in, in general, were less well-resourced. They had less good IT. Um, I love this. Probably needed a bit of arm twisting to sign up. So this is if, if anyone's gone around trying to recruit organisations into a study, you know what we're talking about. Um, one small practice was so IT naive uh, they said we simply couldn't install the software. So the project manager goes along and says, well, you know, we just can't get started. Um, but if they bought into it, and if you had a keeny, for example, a GP who was quite IT literate and a practice manager who, was, who got it, the smaller practices could run with it quite quickly because they didn't have to get all the different sign-offs. So. The, the whole organisational stuff is, is, is something we're going to be doing a bit more work on um, to get those explanations. Um, Aboriginal health in Australia is hugely complex. Getting anything done, um, you've got to go to three different tiers. You've got to go to the, um, the board members. Sorry, it says board members. That's a misprint. Um, 
then you've got senior management and then you've got the actual providers and you've got to, you've got to work your way up and down that little hierarchy. But here's another interesting thing oh, about the, the Aboriginal health services. So these aren't GP practices, they're community centres, almost like polyclinics, designed to meet the needs of the Aboriginal community. They worked with um, what I would call bilingual health advocates. They call them Aboriginal health workers. So these are people from the community. They've been trained. They are, if you like, cultural brokers. They explain to the doctors why the patient isn't going to follow that advice or why the patient's lost their tablets or what the patient actually needs from a cultural perspective. And they also do a lot of health education advice and also the sort of healthcare assistant stuff of taking the blood pressures and, and that kind of thing. And guess what? They're, they're, they're popular with the community. The crazy thing about Torpedo was that the people who were permitted, had access controls over this health tracker were the doctors. The Aboriginal health workers couldn't use it. They weren't allowed to use it, and yet they wanted to use it. And they were told, no, you, sorry, you can't. That's a really interesting organisational issue. Perhaps it could have been overcome with a bit more... Um, groundwork uh, and I think in the next phase of the study which I can't remember what it's called now I think they've, they've addressed this but certainly looking back uh, they talked a lot about that okay um, this is about the implementation phase um, it needed a lot more facilitation support going back and retraining people. You can't just sort of go and give one talk and tick and say, right, everyone's been trained in this. Um, it wasn't a single adoption process, but an ongoing process of kind of embedding this whole thing in the organisation. Um, they didn't budget for it because actually this is really expensive. Uh, and this is the bit we're going to be turning into another domain in the NAS framework, actually, which is the actual project. Uh, the wider system all sorts of things outside the organisation are going to affect whether or not this falls on its nose. Um, I'll just go through them. Policy, I think these are obvious, aren't they? Regulatory, <coughs> professional bodies, public. If the lay public is against it, you know, database state, you can't have my data, you, you get all these things that make people feel very uncomfortable. This thing about opportunities for inter-organisational learning and sharing, this is something we demonstrated 15 years ago, and we were doing a systematic review. We were kind of pulling on work that had been done 15 years before that. It's been shown time and time again <clears throat> that if, as an organisation, you want to introduce an innovation, one of the best ways is linking up with another organisation that's already got that model up and running. And things like quality improvement collaboratives, you know, that kind of thing is a very good way of, sh of, of spreading complex change. Um, and I don't think a, there was a lot happening with, with, with that. I don't think the GP practices uh, implementing Health Tracker were talking to each other or were encouraged to talk to each other. I might be wrong, um, but it certainly didn't come out in the data I was looking at yesterday. So here's an interesting one. They kind of did it right. They chatted up the Royal College of GPs and they said, please, could you endorse this evidence-based tool? Um, and the College of GPs were all up for this because they'd been decided to have a partnership with the industry partner, the, you know, the one that was making it for something else. So they thought they were quids in with 20,000 members of the college. The problem was that the college then went cold on it. After 12 months, the college changed its mind because various GPs had rung the college and said, oh goodness, you know, this is wasting my time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they complained about the bugs and so the professional body then dug their heels in and said, well, we don't like this. Uh, and, and that's when it went a bit pear-shaped. Here's another issue, um, trying to get government approval. So this stuff, the Medicare benefits schedule, it, you know, can you, can you get reimbursed basically? And they thought if we can link, if we can lock in some kind of reimbursement into the use of this tool, that would incentivize people to use it. Uh, and they, they had an awful lot of trouble with that, and in the end it didn't happen, uh, which was a shame. Last domain in the NAS framework is all about embedding over time. Everything changes, technology changes really, really rapidly. How much scope is there to 
adapt not the, just the technology but the service model over time and how resilient is the organization to all sorts of shocks you know are we going to survive brexit that kind of thing um, let me show you just one lot of quotes i think so someone says well you know what you really want to do with this technology is make it usable for other conditions um, this person talked about a crowded desktop I've got all these different apps on it if you could just pull this up and 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 you know do something with gastroenterology or gynecology as well that would be that would be better it'd be like a swiss army knife um, and then this la this second quote is about um it health tracker sat on the desktop so it was in that sense it was a simple untethered technology but as things evolve over time and as more and more things need integration between primary and secondary care uh, and data being transferred this technology is going to become really obsolete and it's going to fall into disuse okay so there's a NAS framework and as I said I'm going to add a kind of project management domain because the more people are trying to use this the more stuff's coming out about project management um, if you put my name into google with nas you'll get the papers which are really widely cited actually i'm a bit surprised so what am i doing now so we developed this framework to write academic papers with quite frankly and to impress the wellcome trust and to get ref points people are you know that's what academics do but what people are trying to do with the NAS framework is actually make technology work. Uh, now, we can write papers explaining why these various projects we were involved in didn't work too well. But of course, what we really want to do is use it proactively to improve real projects um, and improve the success. So I've been working with Harvey Mailer from the Said Business School uh, to develop something called a NASCAT tool. CAT stands for Complexity Assessment Tool. And it does three things. It identifies the complexities by pulling the narrative out. It suggests where you might be able to reduce complexity, um, you know, just sort of, just stopping the scope creep on all of these projects would help. But, uh, but also it talks about running with complexity given that you can't say to someone i'd rather you weren't an aboriginal with an alcohol problem you can't say that to a patient I'd go, please don't have dementia just have a broken ankle you know that things are complex in healthcare um what can you do to run with that complexity to manage that complexity and i won't go in i won't read them out but there's all sorts of ways you can strengthen the capacity of a team or an organization to handle complexity the one i do want to talk about is this one develop develop individuals and resource their creative action in a complex system you have to make judgments often quite in real time the the rule book says this but the real world isn't like the rule book so i need to do some kind of workaround can that individual come up with the right kind of workaround you know what happens if the system crashes on a monday morning how are you going to keep the show on the road? So actually, it's a different kind of training that, that people need. It's not just, here's how you follow the protocol, but here's how you don't follow the protocol, and, and when is that okay? Um, so this is um, one page out of the underdevelopment NASCAT tool. So what we've got here, th this is an expandable box where the, the person can type in uh, we've said the clinician or the social worker might want to complete this. Well, you know, what's the condition? What's the illness? And what are its features? And then we've got a, a tick list here. This isn't, this isn't even quasi-quantitative. But if you've got a lot of box, if you've got a lot of ticks in, in the red box, the condition is complex. Um, and then just a summary of... Are we talking complexity in this domain or are we not? And we go through all the domains with this. And we've been doing a lot of co-design workshops with uh, various groups, uh, mainly up in Leeds, actually, um, to, to sharpen up this tool. And then this is another, um, it won't be in this format um, when it's finished, but the, how do you deal with the complexities in the condition or illness? Well, for example, where would you find out about the conditions? So many tech developers come in 
having developed a, a technology and they don't really understand the condition they've developed it for. This is for haemophilia and they, they know nothing about haemophilia or something like that. Uh, so we're pointing them to resources like NHS Choices, you know, look up patient charities. The, these are being, these suggestions are being populated at the moment as we run workshops and people, as, as we work out what it is people don't know when they're trying to apply the tool, we're, we're putting stuff in the resource guide. Um, so if I just go back, so this section is understand complexity and then this is about reducing and running with complexity and we go through that in each of the domains. What do you use the NASCAT tool for? Well, NHS Digital want to use it for due diligence. They want to use it for when a developer comes on and says, here's my magic gadget. They want to apply NASCAT. And if there's too many red boxes ticked, they, they just say, no, sorry, we're not interested. Uh, I'm not sure that's, you know, that wasn't what we designed it for, but we're working with them. We're playing around with it. Planning and monitoring, obviously, we do, we're doing a lot of work in Wales, Scotland, Norwich, to use the NASCAT tool to help people plan and project manage their technology project. And then also identifying how to support teams. And I, I was saying to Kazim before I, uh, before I started, uh, I'm gonna be applying for a, a program grant to basically quite an open-ended piece of work where we want to do more with this and then help other people uh, use the NASCAT tool in their technology projects. So there's my take home messages. Simple as easy, complicated, you know, building the rocket. It's gonna take longer, it's gonna be harder, it's gonna be more expensive, but you probably get there. Complex may actually be impossible, maybe impossible. Um, so there we are, discussion.